Hello, 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 and welcome to the Scouse Science Podcast. My name is Professor Tom Solomon, and today, for once, we didn't get the Scouse Science Podcast music, but you've all heard it so many times, it doesn't matter. Holly, would you like to sing the music for us? No, oh, thanks, Tom. Might um, get rid of a few people. <laughs> Would you like to sing the music for us? Yeah, I'll leave that to you. Leave that to us because you you don't know you don't know what the music is. <laughs> now we're, we don't mind having a little technical challenge because, uh, as you have seen, we're in a different environment. In fact, we've we spent ages setting up the camera, but I'm going to just fiddle and just this time. Don't worry about that. Can you see the London Eye out there? We are actually in Westminster, and we're in Matt's office. Thank you very much for having us. I'll pick the microphone up again. And um, so this is our last podcast of the current series. And it's a special one because we've not got an extra guest. We've just got Matt. And we're going to uh, talk about the pandemic and things we've learned in terms of science and policy and how they interact. Yeah. And it's, um, is it, it's actually the right honourable Matt Hancock. Well, technically, but people just call me Matt. Don't technically. That's you. You know, your your mother will be so proud. I'm sure. <laughs> well, yeah. The um, when you become a cabinet minister, you typically are yeah. in Privy Council, right? And that means that you can formally call yourself the right honourable. Right, but you don't use it very much. Well, it, it, what do you think, Holly? Do we like the right honourable? Um, I mean, yeah, I'm all for a fancy name, so why not? <laughs> I don't. I don't really like to hang on ceremony. Okay, that's the thing. You okay. know, there, I, I'm in this because I think it's you know it's about how you improve lives and improve the country. Um, some people love the sort of some of the portentous parts of politics. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm not bothered by. Are that you? Stuff. So we're this office we're in here is in Port 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 House, House yeah. which is on the opposite side to uh, the old. Uh, Obviously, the side of the road. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have you ever had an office on the other side? Oh yeah, yeah. So when I was when I was um, uh, when I was first a backbencher, right, and then also when I was a minister, right, right behind the chamber of the House of Commons. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So they're they're very um, they're not as modern, obviously, as over. What, which do you prefer here or there? Well, I, 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 they're, they're all similar. They Come do on, the job, right? On. Um, isn't that is that the, is that like the first team over? No, the big no the big advantage of being here is yeah. the the officers are modern, yeah, and you get uh, the team and I can be have All offices together, next door to are, each other, yeah. whereas the offices over there are typically just one, uh, they're just one office. So if you're the yeah. minister, you want the office right behind the chamber, so you can just yeah, out, yeah and that's where the you know the prime minister's office is, right. and mine was directly. Yeah, underneath. yeah, we're doing the prime minister next month, you know. Are you no? Oh. <laughs> it would be fun to though. Yeah, Interesting. Well, um, all right. Let me just do. There's a bit more housekeeping we need to do, mm -hmm. which is um, welcome everybody. Uh, as you know, uh, you're watching this live either on Zoom or on Facebook. We always like to check that the technicals are working, and so we would like people to post in. We've not got the chat function working this time because we have found actually, as some of you will remember, on some of the previous ones, when you have the chat function working, you can get a lot of nonsense fed in. Um, but so use the Q&A function. Anti-Judy, the Q&A function is the little one down in the bottom right. And it looks like two speech bubbles. She's a great follower. OK. And uh, just post in there and tell us uh, where you're listening from, whether you are a first timer or a repeat offender. And then today's question, we always have a question to check, um, check things are working. And I want people to answer. Well, Holly, have you had any thoughts about what question? Sorry, oh, about what question? Um, I was going to ask, and then I decided we, we couldn't do this. But I was going to ask people to tell us about their local MP. Do they know who the local MP is? And then tell us something good about them, what they've done locally. Is that a really yeah, good question? Yeah, yeah, great question. Warm up? Yeah. I was also going to include they tell us something bad about them, something you don't like, but we don't. Well, this is a very positive, positive. <laughs> Most people... Um, uh, have a higher opinion of their local MP than they do of politicians as a group. It's one of the, yeah. the nature of politics yes. is that the group is seen as problematic, but the individuals are usually seen as positive. I think part of the reason for that is l almost every MP does good work in their local community that doesn't get much reported. Yeah. Um, whether that's, you know, private constituency work, solving a problem for an individual or, you know, your local campaign to mm -hmm. get a uh, I'm campaigning to get a cinema in in, uh, in 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 Newmarket, like right. we have in Havenhill, for instance, right. in West Suffolk. So right. that's what that's um, 
people uh, see that. So yeah. hopefully there'll be some positive responses. We'll yeah, see. do you want to see? Well, that, like, okay. Holly, that's her job. She'll watch that. You, okay. you, you don't worry about that. <laughs> There you go. So, Damien Hines, always available to answer the, people's queries. There you go. It's That's coming it. in. Yeah. So yeah, it's working. Quite a few, yeah, it's definitely working. There's quite a few. MP Kevin Hollandrake, and he supports our charity, um, the Encephalitis Society, which is what you support, isn't it, Tom? Uh, I'm so, a, yeah. Encephalitis Society. All right. So that's coming in, which is good. Um, I mean, the other thing about it, okay, so that might be because people... Um, uh, see the, what the local MP does. But do you think there's also an element that uh, most MPs are charming? You know, they're good with people as individuals. Yeah. Um, uh, but, and on the other hand, so in an interpersonal way, you know, I might think you're a great guy and I'd have to have a chat with you. But when you're talking about politicians remotely, yeah, it's very easy from a distance to, you know, throw uh, mud shots and, and do you know yeah, what I mean? to and criticize I think, yeah, and, as a mob. Yes. Whereas when you know them individually, they, you know, they, they seem to be reasonable people. Yeah. And the truth is that whichever side of the aisle you're on, you know, you, you tend to go into politics because you want to change your community for the better. I mean, that's that's the honest truth. And then the you know the nature of politics is to have a debate about how to do that. And I think you know what a lot of people mistake for noise and aggro um, is actually the process of us democratically coming to a to a decision mm -hmm. when there's no you know higher authority, if you like, to make that decision. It's uh, that is the process. Yeah. Um, it's obviously far better when it's a uh, thoughtful, considered discussion mm. rather than a acrimonious one. Mm. Do you think it gets too acrimonious? Yeah, time? definitely. I mean, the, the, no doubt about it. Um, and um, the, it'd be far better if it was more considered more often. There were times, actually, coming, you know, yeah. talking about the pandemic, yeah. which um, yeah. there were times when it was incredibly, uh, the debate was incredibly thoughtful. And yeah. then there were other times when it got yeah. quite heated and in an when there was more light than yes uh heat than light rather. yeah yeah um but you know take somebody like um you know my uh labor opposite number jonathan ashworth mm -hmm. throughout the crisis mm -hmm. you know he was incredibly thoughtful reasonable mm -hmm. he came in and helped design the legislation that we needed to get through it um he had certain points i took them on board we yeah. got to a conclusion where we were both happy with it you know th is this th early on or that was whole, that was early period? on because i mean we, i remember we so we met on uh, question time right yeah. at the in march right at the beginning of the pandemic yeah and um uh then i think certainly i was chatting with andy burnham afterwards yeah. he was also on it and we both kind of realized that we'd probably given you perhaps a softer tie a soft, you know we, we'd not given you a hard time at all and i think very much at the start of the pandemic you know it was all about consensus and you know yeah. we need to pull together yeah and i suspect uh, you know as as the pandemic went on you probably found you got a rougher ride on question time and, and yeah things. from uh, from uh from some but not all um and it was different in different places you know um so the for instance you know liverpool manchester you mentioned andy burnham yeah you know there was a point at which liverpool and manchester both had a serious problem yeah at the start of the second wave mm -hmm. and i worked with uh, joe anderson who was mm -hmm. then the mayor of liverpool mm -hmm. and he was absolutely brilliant mm -hmm. collegiate mm -hmm. we brought in the measures that we needed mm -hmm. uh, rapidly we put in financial support mm -hmm. Um, and I just didn't get that from Andy Burnham. Maybe you told him you'd been he'd been too. Soft yeah, I did. Me. I did, and he said, "Right, I'll toughen up." Yeah, and 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 uh, and you know he played politics, whereas Joe did what was best in the public health interest. Yeah, and you know, so you did see different people responding differently mm. to the pressure, yeah. and some rose to the yeah cha the challenge of that pressure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and others less. Do, Andy, do feel free to. Uh, you've just been accused of playing politics. Uh, do feel free to chip in on the uh, comments bar. And um, uh, he, he's a great fan of the show. So he may be listening. I don't know if he is today, but we, we can come back to that. So we are going to talk about the pandemic. We want to talk about the sort of science policy interactions and how all of that works. Yeah. I've not done the, I've not introduced you properly. Right. Uh, I'll just do that briefly. Okay. Uh, everybody knows you were the um, uh, Secretary of State for Health during the pandemic. Let me go back a teeny bit. So you were born in Chester, yeah. I think. Um, Went to King's Chester, yep. posh private school. Well, it, was, it was a good school, local independent school. Is it private? 
Yes, yes. Okay, yes. it's not an accusation. Is it just clarifying? No, but it's it's also not posh. Yeah. Oh, is it not posh? Not really. Okay. I was at a posh private school. Good for you. Yeah, in the northwest. Well, you obviously got okay. good education because it's taken you a long <laughs> way. Okay, let's not fall out over schools. Um, and then you went to Oxford. Yeah. Uh, the two posh doesn't offend you, does it? No, well, it's just a description of my school. That's okay. not how it felt. All right. Uh, listeners from Chester, uh, any others who went to the school, let us know. Yeah. I may be completely wrong, in which case I will apologise. No, too. So, all right. You did politics, philosophy and economics uh -huh. at Oxford. Then you did a master's in economics at Cambridge. Yeah. Uh, you worked as an economist for Bank of England. Mm -hmm. And then you've been MP for West Sussex since 2010. Suffolk. 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 Yeah, sorry, Suffolk. Yeah. And... Um, you were Secretary of State, I'm not giving everything, but just to give yeah. the highlights, Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport yeah. in 2018, and then Secretary of State for Health and Social Care during the pandemic. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's great. I haven't got any questions about that. I just wanted to set the scene. I mean, yeah. there's, a lot, there's lots we could talk about in relation to that. But we want to talk about uh, the pandemic and the sound. So I thought what would be a good start is just to ask you for a list of three, the three biggest successes and then the three biggest failures or areas yeah. where you learnt lessons. And give me the bullet points, and then, yeah. and then, and then we'll I'll dive into them. them. Yeah, I may not dive into all of them, I'll choose them. And, uh, okay, so, um, and that, yeah, I'm, going to, I'm going to concentrate on the science in yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although, you know, the critical thing about the pandemic was the interaction between the science and the public policy and the public. I yeah. mean, that was ultimately absolutely at the heart of the, of yeah. the pandemic. Um, Obviously, the number one biggest success was the vaccine program. Yeah, um, and it, it's a bit like when a when a uh, when a football team wins. Yeah, um, the everything that they did is seen as brilliant, right. um, even if they won three one and conceded a goal. Yeah, um, the vaccine program is is it was an enormous success. Yeah. Of course, there were challenges within it. Yeah, but ultimately, it was success. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give the vaccine as two examples. Yeah. One is. Um, the science, yeah. the acceleration of the approval of the science. Yeah. Um, so not just the um, uh, virology, the vaccinology, yeah, making, but actually making it happen. But it yeah, yeah, but then exactly then the the um, okay, uh, we'll the, come back, we'll come the back data to science yeah. of the MHRA right. in in making sure they could approve it faster than typically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the rollout, which was massive operational. Okay. So obviously the vaccines. So that's a big success. Uh -huh. the second, okay, we'll go for okay. no, um, success. The second success, I'd say, is the recovery trial. Yeah. So the um, discovery that dexamethasone reduces the risk of death of those in hospital with COVID by a third. Yeah. Uh, and then the subsequent discoveries of other uh, drugs yeah. uh, that already existed, pre-existing drugs that reduce the rate of... Yeah. Uh, uh, and reduce the impact of the disease. Mm -hmm. um, incredibly important. Um, and if I can bracket with them now, the antivirals yeah. that have been designed yeah. for the for the purpose of um, yeah. uh, treating people with COVID, which means that the death rate per infection is now much much lower than it was. Yeah. So um, uh, vaccines and so you've got vaccines, you've got and treatment. And third. Um, the third thing. God, there's, there's loads. I, I, I'm going to go for the shielding program. Okay. okay. So the shielding program um, was the program that was um, that essentially gave stronger advice and more support to the mm -hmm. people who are more likely to die from COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and it started covering 900,000 people, and by the end, covered uh, just over two million people. Yeah. Um, now, I have been told, and I want to get this verified, mm. so I'm just being clear about the veracity yeah, of sure. this fact. Yeah. Um, I've been told that the, um, the, 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 the de death rate amongst that cohort yeah. was lower during the pandemic than in a normal year. Right, interesting. Which yeah. is extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and part of the public debate at the time, the political debate, was can't we just protect the most vulnerable and then, yes. you know, get on with it? Yeah. Um, the truth is we did protect the most vulnerable mm. through the shielding program and the science of who to target mm. and then how to communicate with them and how to ask them to do what was needed, which usually essentially meant more protection yeah. and less in social interaction. Yeah. It was very successful. Okay. Um, on the, the more difficult side, yeah. um, so the first thing is 
the the way that some of the rules operated and we had to reiterate on this all the time yeah. the worst example of this without doubt yeah. was the way that the rules around funerals yeah. were interpreted the, in the first instance okay you know people not going to their spouses funerals mm. people not going to their children's mm. funerals really horrific mm. really horrific it was unintentional mm. Um, and when we saw that that's how things were playing out on the ground, yeah. we then modified. We modified. Yeah. And so you had to iterate these rules. Yeah. But some of the initial, I mean, that was really, mm -hmm. really harrowing. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I'd point to is actually a scientific one, mm -hmm. which is the global consensus that a, that a coronavirus could not be transmitted asymptomatically. Yeah. Um, okay. And the the allied presumption that therefore the tests wouldn't be valid on asymptomatic people. Yeah. Um, it turns out neither of those things were true. Yeah. Um, and um, and that had consequences. Big consequences. Yeah. Um, so there's two. Um, a third. Oh, it's difficult. I mean, there's a load of there's a load of operational things that were difficult, but the but the but. Um, Oh, okay. The third is that in this, again, this is something we put right, but only in the summer of 2020, mm -hmm. was that with care homes, mm. the challenge with care homes, this is really important that we learn the right lesson here. Yeah. The ca challenge with care homes was the transmission of the disease uh, by staff working in more than one yeah. care home. Transmitting. Yeah. Transmitting. And, and there was this big debate about people leaving hospital to go into care homes. Yeah. But the, the evidence is that the number of infections that got into care homes through that route was really relatively small, yeah. you know, just under 2% yeah. on the on the, the, the research. Um, the, of course, you can't care for people in care homes without people. Yes. And we didn't really want to major on this point during the pandemic because we didn't want to hit them. We didn't want to imply that mm. we were blaming the staff, which we weren't and are mm. not. The point is that if we brought in the policy that you could only work in one care home at a time earlier, then it, we would have reduced but, the transmission did, into care but, homes. But, but did you know that earlier? Though? No. No. So that was one of the things that became apparent yes. as, as time went on. Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, that's a really interesting choice of uh, both your successes and failures. Um, I should declare it, uh, I'm, I'm conflicted in terms of the successes. So I chaired the funding committee. Uh, right at the beginning of March that approved the development of the Oxford vaccine yeah. and also that approved Peter Horby's trial of uh, the recovery trial. Yeah. So, um, but I would agree. Yeah, well, they, they, well, they were a good day's work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you sit on a lot of funding committees and, and, and you know, trudge through a lot of uh, applications. But, um, um, okay, all right. Well, let's just get back to um, the issues in terms of uh, policy, et cetera. So, I mean, the, the vaccine program clearly has been a big success. Yeah. And um, I've, I've, I've heard you talk before about how determined you were that that, you know, that looked like the only escape room, yeah. the only way out. Yeah. And then I, when were you aware that it looked like it was going to deliver? Um, well, the, the honest truth is we didn't know for sure until November 2020. Right. Um, but I had a, I had a confidence. I had a faith in it, basically, yeah. and my faith was based on the fact that um, it was so important that one of the vaccines worked mm. that I had a confidence that that have something. that something yeah. would come off. Yeah. Um, and so in a way, we were, yeah. you know, if you think about it, the first two vaccines that threw the pipe mm. both worked very effectively. Yeah. The uh, Pfizer and uh, and Oxford. Yeah. And um, since then, actually, the other vaccine have come forward much more slowly. Yes. You know, and some of them that got approved the, uh, later yeah. um, couldn't get the manufacturing up to scale, for instance, because yes. that's difficult yes. as well. You, you know, we, so the, we both of the first two, yeah. well, I, I put it more down to human ingenuity than luck. Yeah, it's a combination. They'd be, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I had a faith all the way through that something would come off, but but that faith was not widely shared. Mm. Um, and there were a lot of people saying it'll never happen. And it was a combination of expectation management um, in case it didn't happen 
as well as it did, as early as it yeah. did. Okay. But I think some people were more sceptical. So, I mean, in terms of the uh, lessons learned or failures, etc. cetera, I, yeah. mean, I think most people recognise, uh, maybe you as well, that uh, our initial lockdown was slow and that we lost, that lives were lost because of that. And I think certainly I, I will accept that, you know, in an unprecedented situation, nobody knew quite when to, to do what. And... Um, you know, you're not necessarily going to get it right with something completely new. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, of well, I think, as well? I think, you know, thinking mm. about this interaction of the science mm. and the public policy, mm. you know, that wasn't a... It, we were trying to make a scientifically based decision mm. and we based it on the advice. I think Patrick Balance has said, you know, the, mm. the, the, the scientific advice was followed in all instances in that, in that decision. And it's a real challenge. Yeah. Right. Because firstly, the the lack of data was extraordinary. Mm. We thought we were further behind um, European nations than we were. Um, and um, the biggest sort of scientific debate was how long will this last yeah. for? Yeah. And, if you remember, and, and how long would people tolerate yeah. lockdown? And and that so, and that's the sort of because the presumption was after two or three weeks, people would be wouldn't tolerate it. They'd be out on the street rioting or just ignoring it. And it turns out that the it, public were have been brilliant. They yeah. Have, yeah, absolutely. So all right. So but also whenever anybody says to me it mm. was you know uh, debates the timing of it. Yeah. Um. Actually, you've got to also consider what if the advice had been to go later, right? Yeah. So so you, you, you're always you're always trying to make the best judgment yeah. based on the information you have in front time, of you. And, and the, you know, the scientific advice, it was unclear. We were all unclear. And I've had, I've had the benefit of, uh, you should maybe, you're, it's an interesting exercise. So I look back, I've done a lot of interviews for the BBC. And you know, it's so easy with hindsight for someone like me to come and criticise somebody like you. But actually, because I've done loads of interviews, I've looked back at them all and almost everything I predicted was wrong. Right. So, you know, it's very... But this is the scientific method in yeah, practice, right? Yeah. Because you, you, you should be humble in yeah. the face of when things go yeah. wrong yeah. Um, and when hypotheses aren't true. Yeah. And that's how we progress. As a, so, uh, that's, how, that's the scientific method. All right. Well, let, we're talking about humility in the face of when things go wrong. Uh, so the first lockdown, like I said, we, I think uh, anyone, you know, whatever persuasion would probably accept the difficult decisions... The, the, what about autumn uh, 2020, you know, when, again, it was clear that things were going to be getting out of control? And, uh, you, you know, are you, are you just, just talk us through what happened then. Should we not have locked down earlier in, in autumn and Christmas, well, by, December? So by, winter 2020? well, remember, we did have a, a lockdown in November of 2020. Yeah. And um, we were trying to respond to it on a more localized basis because mm. at the same time um as there were problems you know we've mentioned liverpool and yeah and, and manchester there were parts of the country with extremely low levels yeah and so we were trying to manage it in a way that had as least damage as possible you know the way chris mm. witty put it mm. which was sort of the, the framework um in terms of taking these decisions is you have to look at the health impact in terms of the direct impact of the virus mm. The indirect impact of the virus giving impacts that you can't do anything about. Mm. So, for instance, there are cancer treatments that it's unwise to proceed with during a pandemic, yeah. notwithstanding the policy position with respect to the pandemic. It's yeah. just that if there's a pandemic, then you don't want to take somebody's immune system down to, sure. to zero. Um, it, it, or you want to do that in fewer cases is the balance mm. in favour of doing that. That's the second type. Mm. The third type, the um, uh, the the indirect impact in terms of other yeah. health measures yeah. if the in all of the of the system having that extra burden on it in, in particularly the nhs mm. and then the fourth type of impact which is the impact of the lockdown measures themselves so you have to take all four of these into mm -hmm. account and that is a harder calculus than just looking at the um, the, numbers uh, uh, the number of COVID yeah. deaths. So, um, are you are, are you saying you were following the science at that point? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm saying we were absolutely taking that framework mm. um, in a way that's really quite difficult to estimate some of those numbers mm. and put that into practice. Now, um, if you look, the other thing Chris said at the time, which is correct, is the only real way to assess the 
health impact in terms of uh, morbidity mm -hmm. is to look at the excess deaths compared to a, a baseline year yeah. overall. And the recent Lancet paper on that, mm -hmm. I think, is really important. And it's and that's what we should sort of base that. that that's how we should make our final judgment. That, rather that's rather right. than just uh, rather than just the COVID of course you deaths. can't do that until you can't do that in yeah, prospect. In exactly. Yeah. Let us pause. Um, Holly, I didn't give you a heads up, sorry, but uh, Holly, join us and tell us what, what are people making of this out there in the uh, Twitter sphere? Hi guys, um, so there's firstly people are just answering your question Tom about their local MPs sending lots of nice um, questions in. Um, so there's quite a few questions that have come in for Matt and um, a lot of them are focused on the care home situation which I think you sort of touched on already. Um, so there's one from Margaret which says why were highly vulnerable people sent into care homes? Um, and another question that's related to this from Kevin Donovan, who says, how effective was shielding um, for those people who were evicted from hospitals and sent into care homes? Yeah, so this is a really, really important question. And it's really important that we learn for the future on this one. Uh, well, I, I, and across the board, but in particular on this case. and. We learned during the pandemic itself because the impact in care homes of the first wave was much more significant than the impact on care homes of the second wave. Um, and there's a, a piece of work by Public Health England that was published last year that looked into this question to try to get to the answer of how can we best protect people in care homes. Now, when people were um, were moved from hospital into care homes at the start. The reason for that um, is that hospital is also a very dangerous place for a vulnerable person when there's a when there's a pandemic on, um, and people were were moved to care homes when that was the when they couldn't be moved to a home setting. So it was much safer to move to a home setting, yeah. and they were they then needed to undergo isolation when they moved to the to the care home and the and, and the accusation is often put well there wasn't uh, not everybody was tested but the problem was that there weren't the tests available at the time one of the other lessons that we must keep in place for the next pandemic because there will be a next one is we've got to have a testing system ready to go so that we don't yeah i mean I'm, to be honest i'm surprised you didn't mention that as one of the failures or lessons learned you no know? you see so there's two the, the testing mm. um one of them definitely a lessons learned mm. is to have a testing system ready to go mm -hmm. um and to have a domestic diagnostics industry that's more uh, um you know bigger than it was go, yeah um, but it wasn't a failure at the time. It was a lack of infrastructure at the time. And the people who built the testing system did an amazing job. The problem was they were going from almost zero and okay. going at pace. Let, well, let's do, we'll just, Holly, we will come back to you. Let's, whilst we're talking about testing, and we've talked about local responses in places like Liverpool and Manchester. So yeah. There's no doubt that the... The, the big testing infrastructure we ended up with where, you know, you can yeah. do a million PCR tests has, has been brilliant. Yeah. But there was a, a gap, there was a window between when testing first started and when we got to establish that, where, you know, where the ability dropped right down. And I think- But that's not true. That's well, not true. The testing- on, Let me finish the question okay. and you can respond to it. Okay. Um, so we were, I mean, you, you, well, you're going to say it's not true. I can only tell you what was happening where we were in Liverpool. And we would have been, so the issue which I want to get to is whether we should have supported things locally yeah. more. Yeah. So, you know, we had testing ability in, in Liverpool, as an example. We had PCR machines that we were ready to convert them all to ramp up the testing, yeah. universities around the country like this. And in fact, all our PCR machines were taken in lorries to yeah. somewhere in Cheshire for the big, yeah. you know, ramped up thing. Yeah. And I, I think a lesson learned is that whilst you're building up your massive infrastructure, yeah. support locally because yeah. that will reduce the gap. So we had this, uh, the, this debate was obviously a live one yeah. at the time. So the first thing I'd say is that there was not a drop off in testing capacity. There was an increase in demand, which went faster than the growth in capacity. Okay, okay? We're, we're playing with... No, we're not. Well, because, no, we're uh, being, I'm being scientific. No, but... Right? I, I, because, I, because let me just finish yeah. explaining the, yeah. this really straightforwardly. Yeah. It, it's about, there were two lines on the chart, not just one. Yeah. The, there was a line in the chart that went up, which was testing capacity. Yeah. And then there was a line that went up that was testing demand, sure. which was exponential yeah. because the growth of, yeah. uh, of pandemics is, uh, yeah. is naturally exponential. Yeah. Yeah. 
and then we've managed to bring down. And so, of course, there was uh, there was more demand for tests than there were tests. Yeah. But that wasn't because of a lack of growth in capacity. It was because of a lack and, of a starting point. And I guess, the, I guess the point I would make, you're right, it didn't drop. But the point I no. would make is that the capacity would have uh, gone up quicker locally. Yeah. If That's, we'd not moved, I understand. All the and I, moved all the people, I and moved all the yeah, reagents. I understand the argument. Yeah. Um, I would be very surprised if that's the conclusion of when we look at it. Uh, and the reason is that um, instead of having PCR machines um, dotted around, uh, we had PCR machines in what became big testing factories. And the rate limiting factor on the number of tests was the logistics of getting the right test tested fast and returned and of course, especially if you're centralizing it rather than doing it in the in the university lab over the road from the hospital. Where yeah, but the problem was that, the, you know, I visited many of those university mm. labs, not your one, but, mm. met, but uh, many of them. Mm. And the problem was, you know, if it, it's in the middle of a lab, you've got two people working the machine. You've then got the, on the scale that we needed. We sure. simply and couldn't and, and, have, uh, like I said, accelerated. Like I said, one, I'm not saying we shouldn't have done the mass Sure, uh, but but it's about the gap. But anyway, sure. let, Holly, come back, Holly. We've lost you. We're gonna let's have a few very quick questions and very quick answers. Okay, if it's possible. Yeah, because otherwise, people we're getting into trouble with people for for not. They think we're boycotting their questions. <laughs> One sentence each way. Let's see how far we get. Okay, great. Um, so Colin McIntyre is asking, given your non-science PPE background, Matt, what did you do to increase your science knowledge when becoming health secretary? That is a great question. Well, the number one thing is that my um, my economics actually I found useful because although the subject matter is different, the the statistics required for economics and the statistics required for epidemiology are actually quite close to each other because it's ultimately the interaction of science and human behaviour. But the but in, obviously that I needed to apply a scientific basis um, elsewhere, i.e. statistics, into uh, this field. And the answer is I listened a lot to clinical advisors, principally Chris Whitty and JVT. Um, and my job was to be able to translate um, scientific um, advice and insight into... Uh, communication with and, and and a way to discuss with people who were non-experts. So actually, you know, having enough to understand what was going on, but also having, you know, not being overly expert, I found, uh, I found helpful because my job was to communicate to, you know, to, to, I always thought of my, my granddad sitting next to the camera when I was talking into the camera at the podium, you know, um, uh, bright switched on yeah. guy, yeah. but not an expert yeah. in, in this stuff and and so that's the um that's how i thought about it holly we'll give you one more was, um, that, okay. was that one sentence no it was longer but it was short it was, you know, <laughs> um, okay last one um from philip males with a nightingale hospital is a waste of money no good answer let's move on <laughs> the answer is they were an insurance policy yeah. They were used, um, lots of people say oh, they were never used, not true. If you were one of the people treated in a Nightingale hospital, you'd be glad they were built. But crucially, they were an insurance policy because we didn't know the point at which the infection was going to cap out uh, when we put them in place. Thanks. Let, let me, I'm going to come back to something that was raised by uh, Colin, this question of, um, you know, appropriate backgrounds for, for people. Yeah. Now, um, so clearly... Uh, I, I don't want to particularly revisit the argument about whether, you know, should the minister yeah. always have a, a background in whatever it happens to be? Because yeah. clearly that's not the way UK government works. Yeah. Um, but I guess my question is this. Uh, I think uh, currently of the third, well, let me ask you. Right. I don't want to catch you out. I'm not trying to catch him out. Jump in. If, uh, Go he's, on. He's got his I don't know. Job. I won't know the answer. Well, you might. How, how many cabinet uh, ministers have a science background? Um, I know Therese Coffey does. I think she has a PhD in chemistry. Uh, there's one other, I think, Alex Sharma okay. is a, uh, has a physics background. Okay. So that's two out of 31, 32. Right. Um, which is small. 
Well, I, uh, and, and to the question, answer to that is yeah. we need more scien yeah, scientists well, in the House of Commons. That's the question. Yeah. Um, how, you know, how, so, how so, do we attract more uh, scientists? It's a good question because I regard myself as, you know, I'm a social scientist. Yeah. So, and everybody knows that e economics is a combination of science and art. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, there's maths and, um, uh, there's maths and, and statistics in particular deeply embedded in it, yeah. but it's also about how that interacts with you know, human behavior. Humanity, yeah. Now, human behavior yeah. can be studied and should be studied scientifically, mm -hmm. uh, but it isn't a hard science. Um, and um, my view is that, you, you know, having a combination of the two is actually what, what you need when your job is to represent the people in the decision taking. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I have seen circumstances where, you know, it, people who are subject matter experts, um, sometimes find it hard to get the perspective in the same way that if you're not a subject matter expert, you need to make sure you do the work to understand the subject as best, yeah, yeah. best as possible. Yeah. Okay. So, but um, I, uh, you know, at times it was like, you know, it, I, I had brilliant advisors around. Yeah. And, and I was at university with Chris and so, right. I, I, you know, I think you've had good support from the whole team. And one, one thing I want to think about a little bit is the way that scientists and politicians interact. Yeah. Um, I think it was Margaret Thatcher, wasn't it, who said um, advisors advise and ministers decide. Yeah, she was a scientist. She was, yeah, yeah. Do you think uh, we'd have done better in the pandemic if she'd been in charge? I've absolutely no idea. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, so that was her mantra. Yeah. The mantra of this government seems to be we follow the science. Well, I always like to use the phrase, um, all decisions were guided by the science. Right. Because I agree with the principle that advisors advise and ministers decide. Yeah. And we live in a democracy. So it's, that's right mm. as well as um, accurate. Um, and the. Um, so why I, did you say guy? You say we get guy. I, I use the word guy because yeah. sometimes you need to make bigger calls taking into account bigger considerations. Let me give yeah. you one example. Mm. In the vaccine program, um, you know. Some there were some people in the system saying, well, um, in order to protect um, uh, the, those who are most vulnerable to COVID, we're going to need 30 million of these mm. vaccines. And mm. I said, um, uh, no chance. We've got to have one for every um, every adult in the yeah. country yeah. because everybody's going to want this vaccine. Yeah. Um, that was a that was essentially a judgment. Either way, how mm. many to buy? It was a judgment, mm. and my my judgment was that we needed uh, we needed more, we needed one for everyone. In the same way that, you know, um, if, if I hadn't intervened, the Oxford jab would have been developed by, not by AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. Now, in the normal um, translation of science into um, pharmaceutical, uh, you know, into, into medicine, yeah. um, you'd normally leave that to the university and the company to sort out for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But, I knew from, I just knew that the moment we had a vaccine, there yeah. would be massive international pressure. Yeah. And I wanted it made on shore. Yeah. I'm, I'm, an, uh, you know, I'm an internationalist. I'm not a, mm. uh, 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 you know, I'm, I, 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 I believe in international trade. Um, but on this occasion, on, because of the geopolitical sensitivity, I wanted it made sure. on shore, and that so that that's an example of a consideration out with the science. That has so to it's be more, I mean, there. I think it's much more honest to say guided by the science. I wish you'd all been saying that from the start instead of we're following the science, because the problem there are several problems with saying we're following the science, and one is sometimes you you know you're clearly not following the science. I think the science would suggest one thing. Uh, but you know, but also, you know, what's the science, right? Well, exactly. The, the science, science is the amount of opinions, of, yeah, and the way and that the, it, and the opinions change. I think I so. Think the proper way, that, is right. a good So the proper way that it works mm. is that you have groups of scientists, however organised, they advise the the the, the senior scientific mm. officers. Mm. You know, culminating in the C uh, the CMO. Mm. And the CMO advises ministers, mm. having taken into account all the scientific consideration. You know, there were people who sure. were professors yeah. saying things that were 
in my view, deeply unscientific. Yeah. Uh, about and, and about... you've got the whole um, uh, alternative sage. Um, you know the fact that we had an alternative. Uh, it's quite, so, so you know, so you need to have a, a, a way of ensuring that when yeah. I needed a scientific opinion, I could get one, mm. and I got had high quality scientific advice. But then I took the decisions based on that. Do you think so? This arrangement that we've had, where Chris uh, or Patrick uh, or JDT um, or Patrick were up there in Downing Street, yeah. you know, on the podium with you yeah. or with Boris Johnson or yeah. somebody. Um, again, there's I, I can see a lot of sense in that because yeah. it sort of provides a unified focal point. But again, I think there's a, a slight, not maybe not dishonesty, but um, you know, if you think about it, if you're being guided by the science but are not following the science, there will be times when you are, you know, the science says X, or maybe the science says A, B, C, and D, and you're having to choose C. Yeah. And the problem with everything funneling through that single channel is it kind of implies potentially that there is just one science, and here it is. And I just, I mean, I've chatted okay, with so, colleagues and friends, yeah. I just wondered whether an alternative model yeah, okay, yeah. would have been uh, the scientific advisors uh, do a separate briefing you know, perhaps just before their political advice, where they're actually able to lay out what the options were a bit more. And I just, I think the advantage of maybe laying out the options and say, if you take face masks, saying early on, well, you know, this is the thing with face masks, we, the evidence, you know, there's a range of evidence points, there's a range of opinions, we're not completely sure, for the moment, we don't think they're needed. And that setting that out might have actually got rid of a lot of the sort of back chat then of all the other scientists who look and think, well, these guys haven't considered everything properly. Well, I think that the, um, at the fundamental root of how to solve this problem is the challenge of communicating risk-based decisions yeah. through the media environment to, to the general public. Yeah. And this has always been a challenge. Um, I think that in some places, actually, we did it during the pandemic better than it's than I've ever seen it done, because it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people like um, uh, Chris Whitty and JBT and Susan Hopkins and Jenny Harris yeah. and um, uh, and Patrick Valance, you know, they did a, I think, a very, very, very good job of communicating. Whether both of the pay, they did do separate scientific yeah. briefings. Yeah. They did um, also go on the media, you know, one on one, yeah. um, and they stood next to the uh, the prime minister or me or another um, uh, uh, democratically elected person. That's why you know that was our legitimacy to be there, yeah. um, and their legitimacy was their subject matter expertise. And communicating risk in the public sphere is really hard. We thought a lot about it right from the start i think again where we got it best was in the vaccine program mm -hmm. so for instance you know the decision to go full transparency on uh, on negative events mm -hmm. on uh, the vaccine program was in my mind obvious and the only right thing to do but it wasn't an easy media call because those mm -hmm. things could have been blown out of proportion mm -hmm. in the way that mm -hmm. you know negative things are blown out of proportion sometimes. Um, but the media behaved responsibly and took it very seriously and tried to explain risk. Yeah. Um, and um, I think we got that. You know that I think that went well and one, is one of the reasons that the vaccination uptake was so high. Mm -hmm. But but this this communication of uncertainty is is. It is really hard. And what we tried to do was be as straight as possible about what we did know, what we didn't know, and what with what confidence we knew what we knew. But it's never easy. Yeah. yeah. Um, let us jump to Holly and see what's happening out there in the rest of the world. Hi. Um, so I'll try and be quick with these few questions. So there's one here um, that's um, from Kevin Donovan, who's saying, isn't the answer to so many questions that over more than a decade running down the NHS and local authorities and health services and outsourcing to a range of pro questionable providers are bound to leave us unprepared to handle a pandemic? The answer to this is that, um, the firstly, the NHS was better funded and had more people than ever before at the start of the pandemic. 
But the bit that I really disagree with Kevin on is the uh, point about outsourcing. Because what we actually discovered in the pandemic is that there is no way we could have responded as effectively as we did. Um, and whatever you think about the response, the level of response would have been less good if we hadn't worked collaboratively between government and its agencies, including uh, the NHS, the, um, the academic world, and the private sector. We needed all three or all four of those. Um, it was absolutely vital, for instance, there's no way we could have produced the vaccine this quickly without AstraZeneca and Oxford Biomedica and WOCAR and the rest. No way. Um, the, and the same was true of many different areas. It is the collaboration and teamwork that makes it happen. Um, OK, a few questions about PPE. So were the government too slow to deliver on PPE and why the faulty PPE clothing? What a waste. That's coming from someone. Yeah. So, so actually, this is an example that we were talking about about yeah. um, about the reporting of proportionality. Um, you know, when we bought PPE at such scale, mm -hmm. when you buy anything at that scale, some of it is going to be go wrong. Yeah. Um, and the amount I haven't got the proportion in my head, but the amount that went that went wrong was not a particularly high amount given the sheer scale of the purchasing. Um, we had the big stockpile of PPE. Uh, we burned through it very quickly. And when out, we were buying from very early, from mm. before it started getting used up, um, but it became the most in-demand global item in a very, very short space of time. And so it was very, very tough. And I've said before that you know, there is, yes, there were individual shortages of PPE in, in, in some places, but there were, there's no evidence that there was a national outage. We got pretty close to it, but there wasn't. Um, so actually, you know, I take my hat off to the people who were buying PPE. It wasn't me. I didn't have anything to do with the contracts themselves. But the people who were buying PPE, um, they worked incredibly hard to keep people safe. Uh, and of course, there's been a post-match analysis on, you know, but the, the, the standard question you ask of government, government, you know, could you have got that a bit cheaper? Well, that wasn't the context at the time. The context at the time was um, just people down. urgently needed PPE in order to save lives. Are you happy with that, Holly? Um, well, I'm not sure I agree, I, I agree entirely, but um, I'm here to, to answer the um, sh don't shoot the messenger sort of thing, I guess, with me. Um, have we got time for a quick other question? Uh, yeah, do, and then we'll, and nope. then there's a couple of things we'll chat about at this end. Okay, a more science-based um, question here. So why is there an age limit for the shingles jab, but not the COVID one? An upper age limit. Um, yeah, I think that's what it, I think that's what they're alluding to. I think this is from Auntie Judy, actually, Tom. Yeah, okay. I told you Auntie Judy had been there. She's a great <laughs> I'm not an expert in the shingles jab. Um, so I, this is... I might be able to help with that one. Okay. It, it cost you. There you go, pass it over to the clinician. <laughs> That's what I would have done if we'd been at the podium. This one's for you, Tom. Uh, yeah, no, no. Yeah. Um, the, so the shing well, clearly the COVID jab has been given to a whole range from children all the way through to the very elderly because the, the benefits outweigh the risks. The shingles jab is not used nearly as much in this country as in places like America and Europe. And there's a big debate going on about whether we should be using it more widely in the UK. And actually, that's something you mentioned in Cephalitis Society earlier, of which I'm the president. That's one of the things we're pushing on there because, because the shingles virus also causes brain infection and, and encephalitis. So um, uh, the short answer is it's about risk, benefit and health economic analyses. And at the moment in this country, its use is limited because I think the feeling is that the, the tipping point's not reached, but we are pushing on that. Um, let's, let me move on to, to, to a couple more yeah. things with this end here because um, Matt Ashton is the director of public health in Liverpool. Yeah. People sent questions in in advance. Yeah. And so, of course, Liverpool, um, I mean, we want it's just think about regional response versus yeah. national response. Yeah. And clearly, um, with some of the with some elements, the local response, you talked about working with Joe Anderson to, yeah. for local control. Um, there are also things where for example, Liverpool did the mass testing program yeah. to see would it work, yeah. could it help? Yeah. And Liverpool was involved in the um, events research program. We had the yeah. first big the party. First, I remember. First yeah. party. Where did you? Where were you? Would you like to come? No, up? 
Uh, no, I remember watching it, seeing it on the news. Yeah. Yeah. Any former colleagues of yours that like to do a bit of partying now and again? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to get rugby tackled. No, no, no. Um, uh, so, so, but uh, seriously though, in terms of the local response, yeah. with things like public health, uh, again, yeah. that ended up being, you know, uh, tracking and tracing ended up being sort of not outsourced, but done nationally, maybe again at the expense of doing Yeah, so research. here I think there's more of a, more of a point. So on the, yeah. on, the, on the testing, because it was essentially a, uh, a, 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 com- a commodity, a commoditized service, mm. Um, I think that the only way to expand it as fast as possible was to get the machines into big factories, right? Yeah. And we can, you know, we can discuss it until the cows come home. Yeah. Um, on tracing, I think that it, the local element is incredibly important because that is, that's about the human local interaction and local knowledge, and, local knowledge mm-hmm. and, and community knowledge. And we did increasingly sort of... Um, uh, integrate the uh, the national into the local system. You needed the national system as well. Mm-hmm. You couldn't do it without because the national system was necessary uh, to provide the scale. Um, especially if there was an outbreak in one area, you needed a you know you needed the, the cavalry to be able to man the call centres. But then you also needed people on the ground to go and knock on. Do you think the and, balance and, was wrong? Well, I think we on? Uh, yeah, I think we got there. Yeah, I think we got there. And um, I think also. You know, one of my frustrations um, that we did manage to fix was the data transfers. You know, and Matt will remember this. You know, getting having to have data transfer agreements is necessary because there's personalised health information. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, it, data, 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 data. You know, and with the vaccine effort, again, we got the data architecture right from the start, and it was and and, and that local national interaction was much easier. Um, but with uh, with contact tracing, the the local was crucial but you couldn't have done it without the national i remember i remember a conversation with my spanish opposite number and i said what about your old contract tracing we've got this challenge that we can't integrate the national to the local easily enough he said oh it's terrible mine's completely localized and when there's an outbreak in one city the system there falls over and i've got spare capacity elsewhere in the country you're far better off with the national system and i thought well the grass is always greener yeah, yeah. Do you feel, um, so Public Health England, as it was then, is now the UK Health Security Agency. Yeah. Before it was Public Health England, it was the Health Protection Agency. Yeah. Before it was that, it was something called CCS, Communicable Disease Surveillance Service, CD. But part of it was, remember. Yeah. So the part of the problem with PAG was that it was both a communicable diseases and the non-communicable diseases mm. public health agency. Yeah. And the natural instinct, which is totally understandable, if there's a long time without a pandemic, is to focus more and more on the non-communicable. Do you, do you think we should kind of, you know, we fiddle with it every few years and we rename it, we reorganise it, all the letterheads change, tends to be the same people. Do you think... Yeah, oh, but the governance is different. This is really important. So uh, the problem was that under PHG, um, the, 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 the attention of the organisation mm. um, increasingly moved to non-communicable diseases. It just did. Um, whereas well, in, it, well, in well, UXA, yeah. the job of the chief executive is to get out of bed every morning and worry about this pandemic and the next pandemic. But, um, but before PHE, it was Health Protection Agency. And, yeah. and that then, and before that, this uh, CDSS. Those, then it wasn't swamped by the sort of non-communicable yeah, diseases right. because it was a separate, then it was about communicable mm. diseases, wasn't it? Mm. So we sort of merged it mm. to now separate it. Mm. So I've got well, to my might... question, do you think we should, do you think it would have been better if it had just been left as it was over the years rather than... Well, that's one of those um, counterfactual questions you have to ask a historian. My view is that I, I, you know, I was the health secretary with a single public health agency mm. where it was evident that its job had been increasingly and, focused on the peacetime, if you like. And do you think, do you think, it, so part of, you know, people, people like Matt and others working in public health. Yeah. I mean, the other question is if it, and one of our punters on, online said, you know, if it had had more funding, I mean, I just wondered when, when the pandemic started, um, you know, we were, there was contact tracing, et cetera. There was a bit of me that looked at what was happening and just said, you know, why don't we just say, I mean, we've been doing public health in this country for 200 years. It was invented in Liverpool, actually, as the first public health doctor. Um, 
a guy called uh, Henry Duncan, William Henry Duncan. But why didn't we just say to the public health teams, and they do all this contact tracing, you know, for, for sexually transmitted diseases, other diseases. Why didn't we just say, you guys, you know what we're doing. Just tell us how much money you need. Just ramp up what you're doing. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I come back to my conversation with my Spanish counterpart. I, I, I we'll do that alongside. Ah, that's, that's, so there's a difference. Yeah, so ramp up the local, yeah. Yeah. And, and a bit like the testing. Yeah. Ramp so the, and the reason that the local and the national didn't interact at first was largely data flows. Um, but that's a, I think, well, that, that's, I think that's an open question because that is essentially where we got to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, data, would, just give me a moment for me to check. I'm, I've got my sort of wrapping up kind of question. Okay. Which we'll come to. Okay. But I just want to check I'm not going to get into trouble for, um, if I was a proper journalist, I wouldn't be doing any of this. You, you know that. Well, what you would be doing is you'd be doing it without telling me you're doing it. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm a very honest, open guy. Yeah. So give me a moment just to check. There's nothing really important that I'm going to get into trouble about for, for missing out. Do you feel you've had a, you know, have we discussed properly this area of science and policy and communication and the big things you've wanted to say that I haven't asked you? Well, I think that the, the single most important thing in that space is that we um, really analyze now for next time the way that the both internal communication and external communication is done and think very, very hard about it. Um, and my, you know, there are lots of different elements to that. But I just think it's it, it, it's too easy. It would be too easy now mm. for the for the scientists to go off and continue doing the science. And I hope that we le- keep some of the improvements, like um, accelerated access to um, to regulation mm-hmm. for yeah. uh, new drugs, um, and for the uh, policy officials to go off and do their thing. Yeah. Um, the 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 interaction of the two is so important we mustn't lose Lose that link so i have found a couple of things that i I did want to uh, come mention or just discuss briefly i mean one is so like you've said it's really important we don't we learn the lessons and take them forward yeah i'm slightly worried if i'm honest um about so you'll remember well you won't remember but my understanding is after world war ii everybody wanted to forget about it and move on right and, uh, you know, um, our prime minister made an announcement in Cornwall in mid-2021 about how we were going to fund all this future research on, on p- pandemic research. And right. in, in Liverpool, we've established the Pandemic Institute, right. uh, but that was with £10 million of philanthropic funding. Yeah. And the scientific community are kind of sitting, waiting, wondering what's happened. I can't remember what the promise was about how much money was going right. to come. So I'm slightly worried that people will forget and want to move on. And, uh, you know, all this supposed support to prepare us better for the future isn't going to come through. So um, have okay. you got your checkbook? Well, I don't have not a checkbook. in charge anymore. No. <laughs> um, but when I, you're but, back in charge, could but, you uh, get the checkbook? Well, I tell, I, 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 of course I buy the argument. Of mm. course. Of course. There's going to be another pandemic. Mm. The only question is when yeah. and what disease. And we need to be ready. How do we make sure that those promises? Are- well, if you think about it, the things that were hardest were the things where we didn't have the systems already, of which you know testing and large scale contact tracing were two good examples. So in your mind, um, but there's others. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And 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 in public policy, maintaining a problem for that maintaining a mechanism that, yeah. that isn't needed for some time is actually a really hard problem because of the attention sure. drifts yeah but we do it in other areas of life in um, particular security and, and we, we we did do it for pandemics uh, you know we had the 2009 flu pandemic and i think perhaps part of the reason why this one we were caught unawares is because that one turned out to be mild in the end it mm. did spread around the world but it was a mild virus mm. and i wonder if that meant people mm. were a bit more relaxed mm. about this kind of threat mm. than, than than they should have been yeah i remember all of the all of the preparation that had been done before my time as health secretary was based on the assumption of the pandemic flu. And I don't know why that assumption was made, but that's a big assumption to make at the start of a pandemic preparedness plan. Let's just move on to one other thing quickly, which is uh, we've talked about communication and you think it's really important, internal communication and external. Um, how are we going to deal with all the, the sort of anti-science sentiment? Should we, should we deal with it? I mean, yes. 
Twitter's just been taken over by Elon Musk, who's yes. going to release the whole thing and say you can say what you like. So how do we deal with well, it? Well, is he? Is... So, uh, firstly, I'm not sure. Well, we'll see what how that so, plays yeah. out, and that's subject to a whole other podcast. Yeah, right. But um, I, I, I'm actually more of an optimist about this. Mm. I think that the reputation of science has gone up considerably during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, the public has engaged with science at a level never before. Um, because it's directly impacted their lives. Now, of course, there is anti-science sentiment, you know, there's anti-vax sentiment. Um, And one of the things that we learned in the how to communicate and that worked well, we learned from uh, how, actually, we learned from how we'd um, uh, uh, defeated the um, Daesh Islamic State propaganda online, which Mm. is not to respond directly Mm. to the illogical, Mm. but is to counter with a lot of objective positivity. Uh, Now, we did this most obviously, again, in the vaccine project, Mm. right? Because um, when you had an anti-vaxxer online, we didn't go in and have a go at that anti-vaxxer. We just had really well-trusted institutions like the NHS, the BBC, the Queen, Mm. um, doing, putting forward in their various different ways, the positive, objective, enlightenment view of reality. Um, So we, those of us who believe in science, trust in science and the scientific method, you know, we need to be confident and we need to be on the front foot. We need to be proactive in our communications. We need to communicate in a way that um, that non-scientists understand and not say, well, there's a big divide. Mm -hmm. I don't don't think that helps at all. We need to be um, we need to be optimistically positive with the spirit and the values of the Enlightenment, because this is how the future will be built in the same way that the past you know, 300 years has seen the advance of the condition of man uh, like never before. And so we've got to be positive. Just to keep putting that. out the positive. Yes, yes, yes. Rather than legislating against, you wouldn't try and legislate against more against some of these uh, you know, dangerous messages which frankly can cost lives you well i would ta- i would tackle them but you yeah, tackle, tackle them, them through a positive, positive narrative okay and through believing in the power of science let me give you re- one example that i'm very very proud of um it's that there were people putting huge pressure on uh, us all the senior clinicians and us as senior politicians to to stop certain trials and just give everyone this drug because yeah. I can see that it's working. Yeah. You know, I've got this drug, hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. It works, it saves lives. Mm. You're killing people by mm. not giving it to everyone, yeah. right? Because we didn't give it to everyone yeah. because we had a clinical yeah. trial. Yeah. Clinical trial comes out, shows yeah. the effect is zero. Yeah. Now, in some other countries that will remain nameless... Oh, uh, name them. <laughs> Come on, never will be online. Donald Trump right. went for the, yeah. the short cut. Yeah. And it's not, it, 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 he didn't follow the science. He wasn't even guided by the science. We stuck it, mm. we stuck with the science mm. and we found both positives, mm. first dexamethasone, then others, and negative, negative. results, yeah. both of which are critically important. Mm. And those, that recovery trial, you know, you asked what were the successes, yeah. it was my number two, yeah. because the recovery trial has saved millions of lives around the world and it's because we stuck with the science we stuck with the science so okay. that's how to make the argument for the science with the positive um science messages holly i'm going to ask you to rejoin us we're going to wrap up on this point because it's a very we've had our i mean we're meant to stop at 45 minutes we sometimes allow it to go to the hour and we've gone over the hour but i think uh, that is a very nice message for us to be finishing on this is all about science communication so to have the former health uh, secretary of state underpinning the need for science communication about positive messages is a nice way to finish. I have to uh, just finish off with a bit of housekeeping. First of all, I want to thank Matt. Um, I want to thank his bruiser over here. Did I do okay? Yeah. Um, I thank Holly. Um, I'd like to thank the whole Scouse science team. So if those guys could turn their cameras on and give us a wave so that everybody, people don't normally get to see the team behind the background, but if they want to turn their cameras on and give us a wave, There's many people who've supported this podcast over the last 21 episodes, over the last two years. We will be returning uh, at some stage in the future with some bespoke episodes, but um, please go to your normal source of podcasts if you want to catch up on any of the previous ones, um, including all the wonderful guests that we've had. But uh, for now, from all of us, if you want to unmute your microphones for the big cheery goodbye after three, 
By the way, is there anything I meant to have said that I've not said? No, I'm okay. You can start checking. <laughs> so after three, one, two, three, goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thanks very much and goodbye.